Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you're joining from, welcome to WWF session on the Triple Challenge, Integrated Solutions to Adapt to a Changing World. My name is Fran Raymond Price. I'm the forest practice lead at WWF. It's actually my first week on the job and I can't think of a more fitting way to start my WWF journey than to be here with you at the Global Landscapes Forum. So this conference is taking place at a strange time. Many of us are confined to our homes due to the COVID crisis, yet we have the technology that allows us to connect with hundreds of people around the world. For the next four hours, we'll focus our attention on planetary and human health a critical issue as we face the triple challenge of one, feeding the world sustainably, two, protecting and restoring nature, and three, addressing the climate crisis. A couple of housekeeping items. Please use the chat box to introduce yourself so we can have a sense of who is in the audience. Also, questions for speakers should be submitted in the Q&A, which will be open throughout the session. There you can comment on and vote on other people's questions as well. So without delay, let's dive into our first session. Um, we have uh, some great minds uh, to help us think through some of these very challenging issues. And one of them, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce is Marco Lambertini, the Director General of WWF, who will introduce our esteemed guests and lead us into the fireside chat. Marco, over to you. Fran, thank you so much. And let me just embarrass you and say welcome to WWF because Fran, <laughs> Fran is, our new, is our new leader for uh, a global leader on forest. So very warm welcome and good baptism of fire uh, joining this, <laughs> this session with us. So um, everybody, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining uh, the session. Uh, I'm going to say a few words of introduction, but uh, straight on going into introducing two amazing guests that will help us navigate through a really important issue. First of all, let's say that it's quite extraordinary that um, a virus in a few weeks, a virus most likely, almost certainly, um, um, transmitted through the consumption of a wild animal has brought uh, our global economy on its knees and, and affected the most vulnerable in societies, highlighting even more uh, and once more the deep inequalities uh, of our social and economic system. Um, and, um, and, uh, and a virus that uh, in a crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, that has also brought into focus our unbalanced relationship with the planet. Many vulnerabilities of our society and economic model has been highlighted by the crisis. And one of those, of course, is the fragility of the food systems. And, um, and so this is what we're going to try to focus on today. With the help, uh, starting with the help of two uh, in, in amazing guests that uh, I extremely thankful they agreed to join us. Can you please switch on your video? The first uh, uh, is uh, Isabel, Isabella Teixeira. Uh, Isabella is uh, uh, the former Minister of Environment of Brazil. Uh, she's been six for six years Brazil, uh, Minister of Environment, and she now serves as the co-chair of the International uh, uh, Resource Panel, uh, a United Nations Environmental Program. Uh, program. And she's focusing on research and expertise and ways to improve global and local resource management, something that she already did uh, uh, with incredible ability <laughs> during her mandate in, in Brazil. The second guest uh, is uh, David Navarro. David Navarro um, is a special envoy of the World Health Organization Director General on COVID-19, a really tough <laughs> tough task, David, uh, these days, uh, and incredible international experience, deep health and food and environmental uh, knowledge and experience as well in so many countries around the world. So Isabella and David, uh, thank you so much for making the time and joining us. David, we know that you have to you have a hard stop in, in half an hour. So um, uh, we'll, I will start uh, um, with you with a couple of questions and we'll generate a conversation um, uh, and hopefully there will be also questions from the audience later on. Obrigado. <laughs> Thank you. So, David, um, let me just start with a perhaps general question that will allow you to, 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 to put through your point of view. Uh, so what, what can actually learn from 
this crisis, this COVID-19 crisis, about how to better integrate environment, food, and health agenda, if you like, a triple challenge, uh, and break the silos and see the connections. Thanks very much indeed, Marco. I'm really enjoying my participation in events where you lead because you you invite us to, in, to get involved in such a beautiful way. So first of all, thank you, and thank you to WWF, and really a wonderful uh, hello, good morning, early morning to Isabella Tetiera. Uh, um, thank you so much. Um, can I just be then very quick? I think there are five important things about COVID that are relevant to our discussion today. Firstly, the virus. It reminds us of the capacity of very minute pieces of living matter to really disturb everything. It's a tiny piece, tiny piece of RNA with a tiny cell membrane, but it's capable of causing mayhem inside the human body, many more uh, bad effects than we thought. It's absolutely not a mild, mild virus. It's a horribly dangerous virus that can have all sorts of impacts. And then secondly, people. This is all about people and how people behave. Coming to terms with this virus, which is here to stay, it's not going away, is all about how we behave, because we're going to learn more and more over time that it's, it's the way in which we behave that determines whether or not this virus moves around and causes trouble. Just as we had to learn with HIV, and just as we've had to learn if we're living in Africa with Ebola, you know, viruses and the way they move around depends on us. But then we come to the big problem. Not all of us have the freedom to be able to adjust our lives so we're not at risk. So we know that keeping a distance and face protection and hygiene and washing our hands, that can keep us safe. But there are billions of people in our world who just don't have a chance. Look at where the virus is really causing trouble right now, in Sao Paulo and in Manaus, i.e. among indigenous people and in the favelas. But that's right through Latin America, where this virus is really moving fast. It's in the places where people are poor. It's in the places where people don't have the resources to change their behavior. It's becoming an endemic disease of inequity. And it's causing people to get very angry. The death rates among black people with COVID in uh, Kansas are seven times the death rates among white people. The unemployment among black people as a result of COVID is much, much more than the unemployment about white people. Is that not part of the ingredients in this toxic situation we have right now in the United States? Perhaps it is, you never know. But all I'm saying is this is a situation which reveals inequity and which thrives on inequity. And the only way humanity is going to be able to get on top of it is through paying more attention to equity. Equity in how we live, equity in how we work, equity in our relationship with living systems. And so that's the fourth part. Basically, unless we can get much greater and more satisfactory connections between humans and other living systems, we will not get the necessary balance in society. So it's equity and it's valuing connections with nature. And lastly, perhaps the most important thing we learn is that humans can deal with this. Just look at how many countries, particularly countries led by women, are doing brilliantly. Look at them, Germany, New Zealand, South Korea, Taiwan. Actually, I may have got South Korea wrong, but you know what I mean. Women know how to do this stuff because they know that actually the way you bring about change is connections and involving everybody in non-competitive behavior. If you're competitive and just interested in showing that you've got the, the, the brightest tail, if you're a peacock or whatever, the virus will just break through. But if you bring people together and get the strength of the human family to work and communities having solidarity and equity put to the center and valuing nature, then we can get ahead of this virus. 
but it's going to be a struggle. We have the capacity to do it, Marco, but it's going to be a struggle and we've got to mend a lot of broken things to get it right. Thanks a lot, David. I have to say, this uh, this point about uh, equity with the rest of the planet, as well as between ourselves, is a really powerful point. Our mission is to live in harmony with nature, but this element of living in equity <laughs> with yeah. nature is actually really powerful. Thank you so much. So Isabella. Important. Sorry. There are some people who depend on nature and for whom equity really matters. Sorry, I'll go quiet. I'm no, muted. absolutely. 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 Isabella, you're coming from a country that has uh, a, an amazing natural capital, as we call it, or, or natural value, um, natural beauty, everything. <laughs> and, uh, and forests are obviously one, one major component of that. So in your experience and, and, and through your years in Brazil and as a minister, how the loss of degradation of forest has increased the risk uh, associated to actually both uh, zoonotic diseases, but also uh, how is, is, is potentially affecting uh, uh, food production, food security, agriculture productivity, and, and the livelihood of so many people that depend on it? And, uh, and, and how, how, in your experience, can we, can we integrate uh, nature and, and the food systems in a country like Brazil uh, that is on the forefront of, of this challenge? Good morning. Uh, good morning, Marco. Dave, nice to see you again. Good morning, my friends. Early good morning, as you mentioned. Uh, thank you very much for WWF for inviting me to, to this chat. And uh, okay, let's see. Uh, I, I think that uh, we have three or four points that are very important to highlight here. When you have this dispute or these tensions, we exactly try to understand better tensions and conflicts between values and interests. This is what uh, is still we are managing in a country like Brazil. Okay, politically and economically. My feeling is that considering COVID crisis and post-COVID crisis, uh, uh, you have probably an acceleration of the trends uh, that you used to have in the, in the, the world. And uh, food, uh, food will play, agriculture will play, is playing today, will play in a strategic role considering the future. So probably we need to bring a innovative uh, or a new political narrative, and also try to bring agriculture, look forward to bring agriculture commitments based on its challenges, like that you know, and David knows this a lot, and about the triple, the famous triple S, food security, food safety, and food sustainability. We need to understand better these connections, how this interacts with the challenges, for example, in agriculture like Brazil, uh, that's a tropical agriculture, and that uh, for example, last week, uh, the minister approved a new norm here, exactly seven criteria for bio supplies for the new agriculture in Brazil. We need new stories based on the future. We don't need only the stories that will so well succeed in the past. This is very important how we can bring people together. My second point is that uh, I think that there was an opportunity uh, to have a new good pressure, if I can use this between quotes, okay, on producers and uh, food, food producers. And so the farmers, uh, and then, uh, not that the farmers are just on food producers, but they are biodiversity protectors. We need to understand uh, here in Brazil, we found out that around 100 million of hectares, 140 million of hectares of native vegetation, they are under protection of private lands. So how can we bring this together? How indeed we can uh, uh, manage these guys, consider protection production, and it all means demands, international market demands and consumers demands that probably uh, we should put pressure on to say, we want food in this direction. Third point, the second point I'd like to highlight here is that uh, uh, we need uh, to uh, buy diversity as an asset for agriculture. Not, we need to change our political approach to biodiversity loss, but biodiversity asset, the nature as an asset for agricultural development. It's not only, uh, not only agriculture, but also the na natural resource that fully engaged, uh, 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 biodiversity and also ecosystem service. In my opinion, we need to go beyond the environmental political constituents and bring other economic players into the game. Okay, and this is not only uh, the agricultural supply chain. For example, agriculture in a country like Brazil and also in developing countries, agriculture demands infrastructure. 
how we can bring these guys together, convince the guy that we need to change. It's a big political challenge, a complex solution, but a complex problem, but probably uh, we'll have some uh, important inputs from the COVID crisis uh, saying that uh, we need to accelerate ecosystem as a tool uh, for economic recovery. Uh, it's a new understanding of how we approach our problems, how we address solutions, and more than this, how we can have, I will put in, in quotes expression, a new green global south, because we need to understand what are the players, what are the food producers players around the world, okay? And the developing economies, emerging economies, will play an important role, not only as a consumers, but also as a producers. So uh, my feeling is that we need to bring the guys into the room and we need to discuss with the guys innovative and new political narrative. And uh, also you cannot forget that in my country, deforestation, there's two dynamics. The first one in Amazon is based on the illegality. So it's not agricultural sector, but you have cattle, uh, livestock put pressure on this. But in Cerrado, Brazilian savanna, you have then the, the, the cut of native vegetation based on the law because the guys want to expand agricultural frontier. And you have around 100 millions of degraded areas in Brazil that you can use for this. So we need strategy, we need vision. We need to go into the rooms and discuss with the guys, not only consider the future that so this, something that COVID provoked to us is that COVID brought the future to the present. It is very good. In, if you can have something positive in this way. We need to understand how we can bring these players together and not to uh, 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 raise the tensions or the polarization that we have between environment and agriculture today. Isabella, thank you so much. I, I love debating with you because you are so much ahead of the curve. You already answered my second question as well. So I need to think of another question now <laughs> to ask you. I'll do that. <laughs> yes. I'll do that. <laughs> and I'll do that while David is answering this question. Um, so David, I, I, we wanted to ask you also, um, I think this is probably the question. And, uh, and uh, it's definitely one that we are struggling as, as WBF and, and, and I bet many others do. So you're one of the few people that may ever go at it. How can, vis-a-vis so -vis the, the need for food security, food safety and food sustainability as, as Isabella put it, and particularly the, the growing demand uh, in order to eradicate hunger, uh, uh, malnutrition and, and address the needs, the, the various needs of a growing population. How can we, achieve that and at the same time reduce the pressure on the environment in fact stop the pressure on the environment and perhaps even using this a new approach to restore what or at least some of what we lost how do you break that big challenge well i'm going to pick up from where isabella took us because actually you used to uh, just when you asked the question you said how can we do it and i suppose I don't, if, if we is organizations like WWF or me currently working very much with the United Nations, we're not going to do anything. But people will do it. If, we, if they're given the chance, they'll do it. Because people everywhere do want to value nature. They do want to be connected to nature. No human being as part of the collective of humanity, of humanity that's gonna lead us through this. No one in that collective actually wants to damage, exploit, destroy, undermine, or misuse nature. It's a tiny corporate community that are making a lot of money out of damaging nature that want to do it. And those with whom they are aligned but 99.9% .9 of humanity knows that connecting to nature is the only way to safeguard the future. And particularly communities who actually have spent decades and generations doing this, indigenous peoples, farming people, people who work on, in, in relation to the sea or to fresh water, they know that nature is not just the lifeblood of society, it is the whole core of society. So listening to people, giving people the space, giving people the opportunity 
to let themselves connect with nature, to let their children be connected to nature, to let their businesses be connected to nature. It's there, the energy is there. We've seen it in so many different areas and places and moments. And the only thing that stops them is those forces that are making capital and income out of destroying nature. And that's the community we have to work on. And it's so through the mobilization of the popular energy that change will happen. And so I shifted from how can we do it to how can we create the contexts, the spaces, the opportunities, the energies to enable that to happen. That is what I see it is all about. And just a couple of points. Connecting to nature creates an opportunity for resilience. Connecting to nature creates opportunities for income. Connecting to nature creates opportunities for intergenerational sustainability. Connecting to nature creates opportunities for a world that will stop getting warmer and warmer and warmer until it becomes in uninhabitable. So what we have to do is to give space to the voice of the people. And that I think is what WWF and others can do. That's what the United Nations has to do because the United Nations, first three words of the charter are, we the people. Thank you so much, David. Um, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to the particular point you just made uh, about the people in, in our closing, I hope. Um, Isabella, <clears throat> um, here is the new question in a way, but not the really then, I mean, yes, but I'm sure you got it, got it before as well. Uh, um, so the issue between deforestation uh, and agriculture uh, uh, has been known for decades. And, and we have con continued to see uh, the impact of, of expansion of agriculture in a sustainable way and deforestation. We've also, seen, we've also seen increasing number of pledges, agreements, commitments, corporate level, governmental level, national, multilateral. Still, the deforestation figures are rising. And so what we are getting wrong, what should we be getting right? What should we be doing differently to, to really uh, uh, bridge, commit, translate commitments into actual reduction of deforestation? Oh, this is a, <laughs> it's like a Pandora box, okay, that, that's open and how we can uh, manage our goals and our problems. Uh, I think that uh, we need to consider two or three aspects that are very important uh, politically. The first one is that uh, a country like mine one, like Brazil, we uh, were absolutely able to tackle deforestation meaning because it's, it's based on illegalities. It's an environmental crime. So it's uh, what it means in the econo considered economic approach. The deforestation uh, uh, doesn't add economic and social value uh, formally for Brazil. Okay, you have uh, fiscal crimes, you have uh, 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 slavery work, you have everything that is so bad, it's part of this, okay? So, uh, but considering uh, 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 the economic cycles and also economic responsibilities. We have a big issue today, a global issue that uh, 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 is addressing this agenda that means uh, climate change, okay? And the climate change, uh, what people have a common understanding is that deforestation provokes uh, uh, the raise of emissions or carbon emissions in countries like Brazil. It's true but also provoke high damage for nature, of nature, okay? And high damage on biodiversity. So my first uh, impression is that uh, biodiversity must emerge as a guiding issue for climate change solutions. This is something how we need to connect things, how we can bring the guys together, okay? Because we need to avoid some uh, uh, political speech or political position saying, no, agriculture in Brazil, uh, we are not responsible to Amazonia deforestation because we are not there. And you have uh, uh, in our other uh, ecosystems like Brazilian Cerrado, Brazilian Savannah, uh, you have the legal procedures to manage uh, uh, land use and also need to understand that you have a private land. Okay, but I'm convinced that uh, we need to convince the guys that they need to protect Amazonia and protect biodiversity and Cerrado. 
it's the economic constituents that even they don't have investment there, they need to protect because this means political assets for, for example, market to consumers, as David mentioned. If people want nature protection, but then people don't know how to do this and that. So you need to understand how these economic drivers like agriculture will assume additional responsibilities, political responsibilities, based on societal requirements, based on consider environmental preservation and biodiversity preservation. This is something for me uh, very important to be addressed, considering not only uh, uh, the illegalities that we need to go against this, we need environmental informants, but also how we preserve. My second uh, 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 comment here, it's very interesting because as I mentioned before, Brazil, you have this uh, national environmental register based on uh, farmers that you know that you call car. And, uh, and uh, we didn't find around 100, 140, 40 millions, 14 millions of hectares mm -hmm. on native vegetation preserved under the private sector, under the agriculture uh, uh, domain. So if you bring this together with, for example, uh, our public lands that are preserved, national parks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is the big challenge that you have today: how we preserve uh, biodiversity and also nature ecosystem service, bring together private and public uh, governance. This is a big challenge because it's not only based on uh, public governance. We need to understand what are the new design tools that you need to improve to bring agriculture together. And the third one in my opinion, to provoke David, because I like to mud uh, his position, uh, is that we need to understand the impact of the new uh, uh, issues that, are, that are, are coming, like economy of innovation. We need to understand how bring bioeconomy as an asset to, to, together in, supply, in food supply chains, not to replacing, but to add value and to add right. food. And also to understand how we can have uh, uh, indigenous people uh, bottom up approach on agriculture, the farmers, the small farmers, as part of this global supply chain. We discuss here values. We need to understand mm. to develop business based also on this local reality, not only the agribusiness, because we are discussing the different scales. And for this, we need to address scale. So a good interaction, innovative interaction between biodiversity and climate change consider the future of, of uh, NDCs and also how you bring the guys to cut emissions to readdress markets, international markets in national one, we need to show the players and the players not only based on business. You have a right. diversity of players that must be engaged. Isabella, thank you so much. And David, I know you have to go in a few minutes. So the last uh, 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 short, the big question, but we, we, we are looking for one advice, not to be, perhaps answer the old questions. Trillions are going to be put into the economy at national level, multilateral level, in order to revive uh, uh, the, the global and local economies vis-a-vis uh, -vis the crisis, the post-crisis crisis recovery. One advice, how to make sure that this injection of finances is going to help us to tackle all the issues that we've been trying to tackle until now, <laughs> from climate change to nature loss to water security, food security. What is one approach to make that happen? Everything has to be people-centered. By that I mean focused on equity, focused on generations to come, and focused on well-being. Just simply have that as the leitmotif for every single thing. You see, if we're people-centered for generations to come, we're sustainable, we look after nature, we look after the planet. If we're people-centered with equity, we address the injustices head-on. And we're going to have to do that and not be frightened of it. If we're people-centered um, uh, in ways that focus on well-being, we make sure that what we offer is good for health and creates opportunities for us to enjoy the best possible life. For me, it's just, it's just so central and I've become more and more radical about this. And I agree with Isabella. 
you know, make ag and food systems connect to people, connect to their spaces, connect to their environments, shorten these value chains, just make it like it was meant to be. And that's what WWF stands for. It's what Isabella stood for. I worked with her on so many things. There's enough of us. There's enough energy around to make it happen. And there's an extra opportunity now. People are so focused on it. David, thank you. Strive on. Yeah, (laughs) thank you. Thank you so much. David, I know we we need to let you go. Let me just thank you for joining us. Isabella uh, can stay with us a little bit longer. Bye, David. And, uh, and thanks for this last point, uh, which I think is, is really uh, the way, I, at least I feel it and I read it, is about hope. It's about actually still having hope because we trust, you trust uh, uh, and hope uh, in, in people and, and therefore people need to be at the center. Of well, the I, I have trust in the capacity of humanity to do a, an awful lot better than what's happened so far. You know, these things, are just brilliant and we can do so much with them and we link them to our hearts and our souls. We have such power and it's just there. And this is not idealism, this is reality. Thanks a lot. Next meeting. Thank you so much, David. Thank you. See you you next time. Thank you so much. And uh, and, uh, thank you again. Isabella, you stay with us. I'm going to now shift a little bit my role for the next five minutes or so. Uh, from uh, moderator to actual say a few things myself <laughs> or what <laughs> I think. And so I'm going to share a, 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 a short uh, presentation <clears throat> that, uh, that would, uh, would uh, help me to, um, apologies, um, help me to go through. Yeah. So the, the, the whole title of, uh, of today's uh, uh, session was about integrated solutions and about what we call in WWF the triple challenge of a stable climate, food security, and space for nature. And um, um, we, we know that um, the, 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 cr- the crisis, the COVID crisis in particular, has highlighted, as we said earlier, uh, uh, many vulnerabilities of societies, but, uh, but also has raised a very prominently, a, perhaps an old question, uh, but in a, in a much more uh, um, aggressive way. How can we provide healthy food within the planetary boundaries? This is really the challenge that the food system has been facing for some time. And now we're getting to the point where we really need to uh, uh, face it head on, as, as we heard also from Isabella and David uh, earlier on. And, uh, and uh, if you like, amongst the the, the, the tragedy and, and, and the misery and the suffering that the COVID crisis has, has created has perhaps also um, created a, a new um, awareness of the fact that we really need to step up our change process in society and move to a different uh, 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 model altogether. Um, the, um, this is the way we look at WWF. Uh, we look at the crisis and the opportunities around the crisis of COVID-19 in WWF. And, if you look at the, the last part here in the graph, um, we have, we're focusing on, on, the, on the issue of land use uh, and the related connections and dependencies with the food system. We're looking at the wildlife exploitation as a specific issue. And then we are looking at the opportunities around the green and just recovery. So let me just say on wildlife very quickly, um, for us, uh, uh, what happened uh, now and actually in the past as well, because it's not the first time we had zoonotic diseases, uh, epidemics, um, what happened is, 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 is leading to a no-brainer conclusion. We need to curb wildlife trade and wildlife consumption as much as possible and as fairly as possible everywhere we can. And of course, I'm not referring to wildlife consumption for subsistence or the supports of local and indigenous livelihoods or, or cultures. I'm talking about the commercial use and trade and most, most, time, most of the time illegal of wildlife. So, and we are seeing very great response on that. China has banned consumption and, and, and trade of wildlife. Uh, regulations are coming into place in a more permanent way in many Asian countries. So we're seeing some, some response and we want to make sure that this is actually uh, embraced by as many countries as possible. On the land and use and food system, we're going to discuss, uh, uh, we discussed already with Isabella and David, the, 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 there is a clear awareness here too about the fact that deforestation, 
uh, environmental degradation uh, in general is, is creating a greater interface between humans and wildlife, exposing us to zoonotic diseases on one hand, but also we also understand very clearly, science is super clear, that dest destroying biodiversity and destroying ecosystems and their services, they're gonna be negative feedback into our production systems. Food first, but also other economic sector as well. And that leads me to the green and just recovery dimension, <clears throat> which, is, which is really about uh, uh, this uh, second uh, layer um, uh, to the hand uh, and, and, right uh, and left-hand side of the slide, the list of the uh, key sectors that we believe the green and just recovery, the uh, uh, economic recovery post-COVID-19 crisis should really focus on in try to inject the resources and shift the direction of the sectors, in particular lowering their current footprint. Agriculture is obviously the most prominent one. Um, we know the impact is huge. We'll see in a minute some figures. Uh, extractives, both in terms of mineral uh, and as well as uh, timber, for example, the whole forestry sector. Infrastructure, which is uh, something that the world is grappling with in terms of developing infrastructure that do not harm environment. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and we know that that also includes the way we expand and build our cities. So. If you like, if you look at agriculture and food production, and we should add fishing in the ocean, then destructive activities and infrastructure, these are the key sectors that will need injection in order to recover. And those injections could really trigger and drive a deep a green transformation. We focus on food in particular because we know that the way we produce, consume, and unfortunately waste our food is the single biggest threat to nature nature alongside uh, uh, climate change. And it is uh, not just about ecological crisis, as we know, as we discuss, is gonna lead to a humanitarian crisis as well. The impact is huge. These are the figures. Most of you I'm sure are familiar with this. I don't, know, I don't need to go through all this, uh, but this is the reason why we're focusing so much on food production and food systems. And I would like to stress again, uh, both on land and uh, in the ocean. And to that, in WWF, to, to achieve that, we, we, we would like to see the, the whole recovery plan uh, leading to uh, investment in political reforms um, and also cultural shift towards a carbon neutral and a nature positive uh, world by 2030. Carbon neutral, we know very well what it means. Nature positive for us means, on one hand, stop losing natural habitat. We have lost already almost half of the natural spaces on the planet. We need to stop that and uh, um, develop our uh, economic system in a way that does not require the sacrifice of more nature. And that requires more protection, but also require sustainable management and innovative sustainable management. Community and indigenous peoples led, for example. Then there is the issue of species and biodiversity and wildlife trade we already mentioned. And then there is the last part, which is connected to the point I was raising earlier half the footprint in the key sectors that today are the drivers of nature loss and climate change and could become actually the solution to both. The big five, as I mentioned earlier, the food system in particular, agriculture and fishery, ag uh, forestry, infrastructure and extractives. So that's the, 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 the plan, if you like, that we would like to see uh, realized through the COVID-19 crisis and uh, after the COVID-19 crisis. And of course, next year, there will be conventions, UN conventions that could embrace these targets as well. The Convention on Biological Diversity, the uh, Climate Convention, the Ocean Summit, and so on. And all this for the benefit of nature, because we have the duty and the ethical responsibility to coexist with the amazing biodiversity that we have on the planet, but also for our own interests. And that's the novelty of the new narrative. This is about nature and about ourselves, but perhaps even more about ourselves. Water security, food security, uh, uh, stable climate, human health all depend on a healthy environment. So that's our uh, vision and our ask and our uh, advocacy. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is uh, the new campaign we were launching around uh, the COVID-19 crisis for nature and for us. So I will, uh, I will now uh, stop sharing and, uh, and invite Isabella to come back in <laughs> and Fran as well. And, uh, and we are going to get uh, questions, uh, comments, uh, opinions from all of you 
connected to us. So thank you so much for listening so far and over to you, Fran. Wonderful. Thank you, Marco, for that wonderful presentation and the invig invigorating discussion so far. And to all those who submitted questions, we have about 15 minutes now with you and Isabella to address some of the questions that have been submitted. Um, so I will start um, with a question for you, Marco. How do we address issues of inequity in times of climate change? That's a big question because I think, as as as, uh, as David said, inequity is um, is about uh, is about many things, right? It's about inequity between us uh, humans, inequity between us and nature, uh, a, a, as well. I I I actually agree with David. I think uh, the best way to resolve inequity is through empowering people uh, to manage their natural resources in a more direct, accountable. And an effective way. And in, in there are many experiences at local level that by doing so, you actually trigger sustainability uh, uh, very quickly. And, uh, and I think there is an element of governance, equitable governance of natural resources that needs to be tackled at the national level and the local level as well. And, uh, and until now, we have good example, but they're kind of very local and small. We need to try to, if you like, codify that approach. Uh, in, in at a higher level at a scale. It would be brilliant to find some countries, political leadership willing, willing to do so. Thank you, Marco. Uh, over to you, Isabella. We have a question on what affirmative actions do we need to solve the triple challenge? Oh, this is really a good, uh, good question considering uh, the food producers and the, the difference that we have among different countries considering food producers. But uh, uh, as I mentioned before, we need to understand the strategies that the countries uh, will adopt or adopt to address the, three, the, the triple S, as we used to say, in agriculture uh, supply chains. My two aspects are really relevant. Probably we need to understand better the dynamics of bilateral cooperation and bilateral trade arrangements uh, considering the demands of the countries that uh, will buy food. So, and also the requirement to address the triple S. Uh, food safety probably will assume a protagonic role now after COVID, okay? And, uh, and food sustainability must be expressed in my opinion uh, consider consumption in production and the supply chains. So uh, how we, we need to understand the dynamics of agriculture and food produce, production around the world. Also, as Mark highlighted, the waste of food and also how we are using uh, natural resource consider agriculture supply chains. So uh, uh, we are the International Resource Panel and we published last year uh, the global resource outlook and you show that and show that that 90% of biodiversity loss in the world uh, they are, they are, this is an outcome from unsustainable uh, natural resource use. So we need to interact, we need to learn how to connect things and develop powerful narrative to bring the guys into the game. If not, they you still will play as what happened today in COVID crisis, you have the international trade based on food. Uh, in Brazil, the, the uh, economic results are really excellent, considering the economic crisis. So we need to understand how we can indeed bring the triple S as a really part of our narrative combining climate change and nature-based solutions. So that's why I mentioned before that we need to bring NBS and ecosystem service as an asset for economic recovery. We need to find this way because this is the agenda, part of the triple, the triple building block that the guys are looking for to address. And my last comment, we are discussing here uh, also how we can develop or propose a new political constituency, bring agriculture countries together under um, climate change and biodiversity embrace. Uh, we used to discuss with the guys uh, uh, in the different groups, but not necessarily trying to understand the dynamics and try to understand the challenges, also the ambition that the sector is, is addressing now. And do you suppose that we're out of the game? We're not a part of, we need to be part of. And, and this means a new political
behavior, not only for agriculture sector, but also from environmentalists and other, other economic uh, uh, pay, players like Mark uh, showed to us, infrastructure, financial sector, etc., etc. So we need an agenda. In my opinion, we need to go into Triple S and propose a concrete agenda to dialogue based on concrete, uh, concrete facts and dialogue, dialogue considering trade-offs. It's very important to highlight trade-offs because trade-offs it's something key for political and economic decision. And finally, understand who will be the losers, consider the triple S. Losers used to assume a protagonic role considering business as usual, politically and economically. We need to understand who will be the guys behind the scenes that we need to convince uh, to change or to have a phasing out process. This means from transition to a transformative world, we need to understand the different weights and how we use this, this pendulum movement to address our solutions or to address better triple S. If not, food security will be one powerful drive, food safety will be the second one, and food sustainability is something that we can discuss in the future. Come on. So it depends, as um, Mark and also Navarro showed to us, depends on people. We need to change. We need to put the pressure on to say that we want food, but we want food consider the triple uh, building blocks and how you can have a constructive political uh, movement to engage the guys. Uh, of course, that you have people that don't want to be part of this, but come on, I'm convinced that uh, uh, most of the constituents will join us if you have a good arrangements, political arrangement, good design tools to convince people uh, to work together, not only to believe in an agenda, to work together. Wonderful, thank you. So I have a question uh, for both of you, um, starting with Marco. Um, science has so much evidence supporting the fact that the planet has been degraded continually, yet governments fail to take real action to save it. What should the people do, really? Yeah, it's true. Science has never been clearer. And this is probably, for me, the biggest uh, difference from the past, because now we know. We know exactly what's going on, and we know actually the consequences, we're beginning to understand really what the consequences are. Listen, I think, uh, I think society, I mean, we're in the middle of a transition, right? So, so we, we can see large sectors of society uh, uh, absorbing what science is saying and, and, uh, and, and is actually jo a job for organizations like WWF and many others to, to play their role, to, to, to actually translate also in, in, in understandable way what, what science is telling us. So a lot of people are doing that. I mean, look at the young generations. You know, I mean, we've never seen a mobilization of young people like in the last uh, a couple of years, and, and that's the result for sure of a deep concern, understanding the seriousness of the situation. I have no doubt about that. So, very, I'm very optimistic in terms of the growth of awareness in society, and actually, that doesn't happen only in the middle class, in the cities, with the young people that you know get out of school. It has happening in a lot of local communities that feeling the pressure of the environmental degradation. And that's my point, my answer, in fact. I think the issue is, is feeling, is, is not just knowing, but actually is feeling the impact or try to project the impact in a, in a, in a, in a material, concrete way. It's happening on climate change simply because, particularly simply because we feel climate change. We feel the droughts, we feel the heat, we feel the wind, we feel the rain, we feel the floods costs money, and back to Isabella's point, you know, this is where economy and environment really meet. On nature and biodiversity loss, it's still a little abstract. You know, species extinction, you know, what it happens, you know, you open your window, you still be see trees, a few birds are still chipping. I don't think that the visibility of the, of the loss of nature and the impact that that could have is so clear yet. And therefore we see perhaps less of a response in that sense. But I see the response growing, no doubt, and, uh, and is the direct consequence, I think, of the clarity in science, but also, as I said earlier, on a number of direct uh, evidence of effect, material uh, experience. And I think we, we just need to accelerate that and translate it into changing consumer behavior and political change as well. Thank you, Marco. Oh. Yes, Isabella, please. Just uh, to comments. First of all is that uh, I fully agree with Mark, and, uh, but you cannot forget that uh, considering the COVID crisis and also uh, climate change and 
uh, science uh, will uh, uh, will be will play strategically as a protagon with a protagonist as a, a player that probably will influence uh, the next uh, 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 time considering the global development agenda and the vulnerabilities and risks. We cannot forget that we are living in a century that uncertainty will guide us. Okay. And, uh, and uh, the only certainty that we have is uncertainty, okay? <laughs> it's true. And what in COVID, COVID crisis showed to us that, yes, something has happened, uh, that is, what is this? But in the, everybody's waiting for science to give the answer. This is, uh, but another side of the coin, probably as a, I'm a co-chair of a, a scientific panel, and I put pressure on the guys Said, please dialogue not only with the, uh, the big problems, but give me numbers considering the national realities, so original realities. We need to bring science into the reality, not the global issues only, but how the global issue will, they are represented on national science. So uh, in climate change, you have some uh, uh, evolution. For example, you can define better as Mark mentioned, uh, climate risk. And biodiversity is something that uh, probably is untouchable and intangible because nature will be the last system to be collapsed. <laughs> this is true. So it's like we have time. We need to, uh, to uh, try to use new design tools uh, uh, to bring people to share uh, not only nature as, as something that uh, it's very important for us, but something that's a part of, quality, of a quality of life. Uh, it's fascinating how, for example, I live in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and Rio de Janeiro is the capital of sustainability. And uh, when you go into the city and you ask people how you connect south with the north of the cities, and everybody will say that you have a female tunnel here, that you, no, we are connected because we have the tunnel. No, the city is connected uh, uh, by a tropical forest. We have a national park that connects the north with the south of the city. Okay, and, uh, and it's amazing how we use this as an asset, as a value for a quality of life there. Okay, I'm, I love to open my window and see the forest, okay, and uh, also the sea. And, but people that, uh, don't understand or don't connect that nature is there, that we have environmental service, and this is a part of our, of, uh, uh, of our quality of life. So probably you can go into the street to... Uh, defend Amazonia, but you not go into the street to defend the forests that are there. That, that not only one; they have two it's national park and a state park, and uh, and uh, people don't understand how to manage it. So this, in my opinion, uh, says that science must bring knowledge, scientific knowledge, to address values and solutions considered welfare uh, and also lifestyles. And this is something that uh, it's a big challenge because you, you, you know ab about global numbers, but you don't know about regional and local numbers a lot. As Mark mentioned, we need to have this bottom-up approach, considering nature conservation and, uh, uh, and how we can use conservation as a strategy for development. Conservation not necessarily block the development, it's exactly the, op the opposite. Conservation is really a, an asset for the future and an asset for a sustainable and uh, 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 wealth society. So my feeling is that you need uh, to bring new uh, lights and bring new design tools uh, to address better uh, uh, nature conservation as an asset and to, science must be part of this, but not the only one, the only one the player. We need to understand that uh, uh, people uh, don't like to be moved, by, uh, motivated by, by fear, okay? What exactly you need to bring more than hope. You need to bring, uh, to save people that you're able to bring solutions and, uh, and that you are able to drive solutions and uh, science will give us some inputs, but you have another one. So uh, I think that is a change of behavior, not only as a consumer, as Marx also observed, but also as a political behavior uh, in society, considering that we need uh, to preserve what indeed means assets, not loss. This is very important uh, to highlight as a political uh, driving uh, force. Thank you, Isabella. Um, that's uh, a lot of food for thought. And um, 
I have building on what you just said, one more question for Marco, and that is um, how can we better value nature as a society? <laughs> I think I think David is right. I said is what David said many times. I don't think anyone in the world, or maybe just a few, uh, but the vast majority, nobody really enjoys knowing that a forest is going on fire or a species is going extinct or a, 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 you know, a population is disappearing or a wildlife is disappearing. So I think we have this intrinsic connection to nature so that we do value nature, but we do value nature morally and ethically. We still don't fully appreciate the material value, economic value of nature that is so important for our current uh, economy and prosperity and survival. And, um, and I think that's the element that because we, we know we've been taking nature for granted for so long and the nature has been so rich, so dominant, so available um, to be used, to be exploited. Now we get into a point, back to the point, the quite first quite the initial question of science, that we know that this is not sustainable. This can go on forever. So we got to begin to internalize that there is another dimension of the value of nature, which is the indispensability of nature to us as humans. And uh, by losing nature, we are affecting directly ourselves. And by nature, we mean the climate, we need the ocean, we need the forest, we need biodiversity, we, need, we mean all of that. So I think it's, a, it's almost a cultural revolution uh, where we, we should stop taking nature for granted value it and understand that we are depending on nature much more than nature actually depends on us. Thank you, Marco. And thank you, Isabella. Thank you both. Thank you. And thanks to David. Um, we are nearing the end of our first session. I want to uh, thank uh, everyone who submitted questions and contributing to the rich discussion we've had here with Marco, Isabella, and David. Uh, to summarize, I want to build on something that Isabella said, um, that we really need a new deal for nature and people that integrates and is based on the triple S's, safety, security, and sustainability of food for people and nature. So I think that was one of the key messages that came across today. So our next session will build on and dive deeper into the triple challenge. Um, and what it means for both people and nature. And we're gonna challenge our panelists to go beyond the status quo and share solutions that are wins for climate, nature, and food security. So stay tuned for the next session, which starts at 15 minutes after the hour. In the meantime, take a break, stretch, listen to some music. If you haven't read our white paper on the triple challenge, there's a link to it in the chat box. And I will leave you um, with just a thought before we go that someone um, mentioned to me maybe six months ago. When we're comfortable, we're not growing. And when we're not comfortable, we're growing. This is an incredibly uncomfortable moment in human history. So let's take this moment and grow together. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Fran. Marco, thank, thank you. you. Nice to see you. Grazie. Lovely, Bacio. lovely yeah. having, having you, Isabella, with us. Thank you so much. Amazing. Thank you, thank you, you so, so much, much, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Obrigado. Ciao, ciao. Obrigado. Bye. Thank you, friend. Thank you. Bye bye now.